coming through the back. I said, let me make sure I come before. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's good. Good to see you. That's right. Good to see you. Leave it open? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, it's just. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. We're all good to go. All right. So. <coughs> okay, good. So after after he speaks, mm -hmm. we're gonna take the questions and go into it, and then we'll speak more. Mm -hmm. Okay, I look at Jim. <laughs> so we're right. Okay. Welcome to our global audience. You are at the Malefe Kete Asante Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you uh, with us uh, today. Uh, of course, uh, we always give praise to Amen, to Ra, to Pata, to Atun, and Kepra, and Ma'at. Uh, we greet you in their names, the most ancient names uh, of the cosmic forces. Uh, at the very end of the 6th century uh, BCE, Homer's Iliad from the 8th century BCE had become one of the defining works of Greek culture. If you put this in context of African history, you know that Imhotep was 2,000 years earlier than Homer. Yet, Homer's Iliad and his later work, Odyssey, uh, have become uh, the defining characteristics of European and Western culture. The Trojan War was called the mother of all battles. Uh, this was a uh, this is one of the stories that was, uh, the main story of the Iliad was that uh, Paris of Troy had taken uh, the wife, Helen, the wife of Menelaus, who was the king of Sparta. And this led to uh, this great battle that he writes about, and we learn about uh, the Trojan War. And you remember the story uh, that is told about uh, Achilles, that the mother of Achilles held him by the heels uh, and dipped him into the river Styx. And the river Styx was supposed to give him eternal life. But his heel uh, was not in the river. So the heel was the weakest part, the tendon. This is where we get the word, the term Achilles tendon from, you see, because every other part of Achilles was immortal, but not the heel. Uh, I, I bring this to you because today we're going to be talking about uh, re-envisioning uh, and uh, Afrocentricity and Afrofuturism and so forth. But I want you to understand, as you probably do, that we are living uh, within the context of uh, a European mythology that has, in fact, uh, invaded the rest of the world, all of the world, basically. We all 
victims of it, and we've been victimized by it. Uh, we know, for example, that Ramses II in uh, 1271 uh, BCE, this is 1271 BCE means before Jesus Christ, before the Christian era. In 1271, he signed with the Hittites after the Battle of Kadesh, uh, the first military treaty ever in the world. And I'm telling you this because you know the story. I just told you about Sparta and the, the Trojan War. That's l l much later. But that has become a dominant myth in the European world. But if you talk about anything, you ought to be talking about Ramses' war with the Hittites and the Kadesh, you see? But we're talking about this war between the people, uh, the Greek uh, people, uh, Sparta and, and, uh, and, and, and the Greeks. So this is a whole, um, uh, uh, and let me just say this, that when you talk about Sparta, this is just a sort of an aside because people in the, those of you who are listening, I'm sure wherever you are, you know, you know this, that actually uh, in the olden days, what now uh, is called Turkey was where most of Greek civilization happened. So that's an important point to remember, that Troy, the city of Troy, was in today's Turkey. It was not in the Greece that we think of and so forth. But all of this is important information, and you will learn more as you listen to the Maleficetti Asante Institute lectures. Uh, we, we're very, very pleased, very happy today, and I just want to say a couple of announcements and, and just a couple of things uh, historically that need to be said. We are still experiencing uh, uh, deep divisions in the Congo. And these divisions in the Congo, I, I, I'm, I look at them very closely, and I don't want to go deep into this because I, we don't have time for that, but uh, Congo, uh, you have now many factions fighting. Uh, Congo is the richest nation on the earth. Uh, as you should say when they talk about boxes pound for pound, mile for mile, square mile for square mile, the Democratic Republic of Congo is the richest land on the earth, the richest country on the earth. But it is surrounded by about nine different countries, and it has within it uh, more than 20 different factions that are fighting each faction fighting for a particular uh, uh, country or interest over diamonds and uh, coltane and all kinds of things that are uh, indigenous in terms of, of, of that country. So uh, just the other day, a couple of days ago, 22 people were killed. It's a, it's a sad story, but we do not yet have a center in Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that can bring order to that country. And, uh, and we'll be talking about uh, Congo uh, more and more because it is uh, relevant to the world, particularly now when people are start talking about the various things that we need in the world in terms of things that we do not have and do not exist in the world. Uh, in the country of Sudan, we have similar problems. Uh, now in Sudan, we know that the, there are forces in Chad, a country that's right next door uh, to uh, Sudan, and the country of Chad, the forces from Chad, have come in and have raided many uh, places in West Darfur and have killed people in that country. So, uh, and I'm bringing this to you because uh, as a person who is deeply con uh, um, concerned about African people and about the African world, I just want you to be aware of where we are and what's going on. And all of these issues are not necessarily issues that are derived from African people themselves. They are imposed upon Africa many times by outside political and economic interests. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, we have big problem going on in Ethiopia. Uh, mainly the fights and the battles in Ethiopia that we are hearing about for the last year uh, have also uh, been provoked from outside. And one reason that they have provoked these from outside is the fact that uh, 
Uh, the uh, Egyptians are very worried about the high dam, the universal dam, the big dam that is going up in Ethiopia. And they believe that if the Ethiopians uh, really uh, function fully with this dam, that what it's going to cause is drought in, in Egypt. So they're saying, wait a minute, we don't want the water flowing from the Blue Nile uh, fully uh, 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 dammed because then we don't get enough water down river, which is north. We don't get enough water in Sudan, and we don't get enough water in Egypt. But uh, this is, of course, a local, uh, local interest, but it's of international interest. And it's of international interest because what it means is that if the Ethiopians control the Nile River and the flow of the Nile River, then all of those communities that are being established in Sudan and in the south of Egypt to house people being brought in from, the, from Arabia, that, that somehow that's not going to happen because the lack of development is going to be tied to the lack of water in those areas. So, so now we have fighting going on in Ethiopia. You look at it and say, well, maybe there's ethnic fighting. No, it, 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 there is an ethnic character to it, but it's also who is promoting these battles that are going on in Ethiopia. And then lastly, I just want to say about Nigeria, because, of course, Nigeria will become uh, probably the fourth largest nation and population in the world in the next 25 years. And right now in Nigeria, we're also seeing these incredible uh, lines of division that are going on. And they're uh, not only ethnic and linguistic and regional divisions, but they're also political and religious divisions. And these things also are being prompted and promoted and provoked by interests that are not necessarily African. So here at the Maleficati Asante uh, Institute in Philadelphia, we're always concerned as a think tank of looking into those issues and writing about them and studying them uh, very deeply. So I just want to uh, make a, a one more announcement before I introduce our important speaker. The other announcement is that uh, our next lecture, and you can go to YouTube, as some of you are doing already, you go to YouTube and you search for Malefic Kete Asante Institute Lectures, and you will be brought at 4 o'clock, at 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. That's uh, for a lot of you in the world, that's New York time. New York time, you will be brought directly to this particular spot. And our next lecturer will be on, uh, will speak on August 21st, August 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the person who will be lecturing is Dr. Na Dove, and she will be talking about the Afrocentric school. That is also the name of her newest book, The Afrocentric School. And uh, for those of you who uh, we'll be here. Uh, some people do come physically uh, to the space. Uh, if you come physically to the space, we will hope to have some of her books for sale. So that's August 21st, 4 o'clock, uh, New York time, Eastern Standard Time, is our next lecture. Today, wow, we are so excited. We are so happy. Uh, I'm happy. I'm very pleased. In fact, uh, I couldn't be uh, uh, more uh, uh, delighted that we have, uh, in my judgment, one of the most critical thinkers in America uh, here with us today. Uh, his name is Dr. Um, Rinaldo Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson uh, is associate professor at Temple University. Uh, he is a scholar of the highest reputation. Uh, his books and articles have appeared throughout the world. Uh, he has spoken in many places in the world, in Africa, in Europe. Uh, he is uh, indeed uh, the uh, co-founder uh, and executive director of Black Speculative 
uh, Association. Uh, he has uh, been the uh, one of the dominant uh, uh, speakers and promoters of the whole area that we call Afrofuturism. Uh, he is uh, enlightened in many ways. Uh, his uh, directorship of uh, at, uh, he was a former director of our graduate program at Temple University, uh, which was a highlight of our department. Uh, he is indeed um, a scholar whose work uh, continues uh, to influence many people. We, we are just um, honored. We, we are delighted. We are overjoyed that uh, he has agreed uh, uh, not even to uh, charge us uh, his enormous fee <laughs> to, to, to come to, to speak uh, to us today. Uh, I, I am um, very happy and honored at this time to invite uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson, to come and speak to us. Thank you. Yeah, I thought Malefi was going to run through my presentation up here, <laughs> <laughs> moving. Um, and I, I've been a uh, follower of Malefi's ideas since I was a graduate student back in the days. And, I, and he's honoring me by allowing me to speak in this space. And I tell people, uh, those of us that were students in the 90s, it was works by people like him, Naeem Akbar, and others that help us stay sane in graduate school. Because the first thing, at least in the 90s, what they try to do is make you think that black people hadn't done anything original and that you had to just uh, cite the European intellectuals ad nauseum going back almost to the Middle Ages. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and th so th their body of work at during that time, which I remember there was this name going around the Temple School. And I think... Nah, you were here in the 90s, weren't you, also? Because I remember you had a fro that was, you had this cute fro, and all this, and I remember it was uh, you, Keto, Asante, Abari, and uh, Abari, Dr. Abari, and others who we were looking at in the mid 90s during this time when this concept that's called Afro is all coming together. And so, how I'm presenting it to you as a person uh, from my formal field of study communication studies witnessed all of this stuff coming together while the temple circle was engaged establishing Afrocology and how in the book I developed Afro along with Charles Jones, Afrofuturism 2.0, I claim that this comes out of African American studies, not out of Wired Magazine and some other stuff. And that's where over the last several years, I think we've proved it, but I remember uh, Upton Sinclair, the critic, said in the past, uh, we have too many people in the academy who know better, and, but their salary requires them to act like they don't know, or their salary requires to write something in opposition to it so they can get tenure. So to prove that they are sufficiently anti-black to get a lifelong promotion, what we call tenure. Um, now, one of the first arguments that we make about Afrofuturism is that it was a word, like think of it as like a marketing coin word that describes a body of knowledge. And I know enough from our history that what we call jazz was not, we didn't call it that. We probably just thought we were out doing some dope music or whatever, and somebody came, well, okay, that's what it is. And came, but everybody understands where it comes from. And in the American context, because one of the things that I don't have time to do the whole global thing today, but in an American context, the central figure that pulls these threads together in the 19th century is Martin Delaney. Now, when you go online, they just say, oh, he's the father of black nationalism. No, he was much more than that. He was a scientist. He was a health care provider. He uh, wrote this book, Principia Ethnology, which was he becomes one of the first Americans to deal with medunature. And this is during the era of scientific racism. 
He writes the book Blake or the Huts of America before the Civil War as a serial a series in opposition to what the book Uncle Tom's Cabin was about. And that's why in the North American tradition, this is considered the first black speculative literature. Or as we say, for an enslaved African, freedom was like science fiction. Okay, they couldn't necessarily see a way out. And so even to write about it was like science fiction because even in European science, they said if you were an enslaved African who wanted to be free, you were crazy. So Martin Delaney was probably looked at as a crazy man. And I was talking with Philip Butler about this the other day, Dr. Philip Butler. I said, do you realize our generation, those people born after our parents struggle, we are the first ones to have the most freedom to grow up without some of the obstacles our parents and grandparents do because when I went to Africa and I taught at um, Gimpa for a few weeks as a visiting scholar and I visited Cape Coast Castle and I thought I said to me the African-American was started in this slave castle all these people that had different dialects that couldn't speak to each other I said black rage started in Cape Coast Castle where you had people standing in there knee deep in feces and body waste with a little window to look out of where they couldn't breathe. And then they showed me the room where the Africans who were just so resistant, they smothered them to death. And then the ones who survived the Middle Passage, as I remember talking to some of the older people, and I didn't understand what it meant back in the time, they said during slavery they killed the smart black people, or the ones, that's why the ones that learned how to read. And then during segregation, they tried to drive the smart ones crazy. <laughs> and then during busing, because I'm a child of the busing area, in the 70s, some of you might remember, they, around sixth, seventh grade, they give you this little test called the Sloshan Intelligence Test. Yeah, that's to measure your intelligence. And I was telling my wife about it the other day, because I, I, my father, before he passed, sent me a bunch of letters from elementary school. And I remember, and I read the letter, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. Your son, Ronaldo, he scored over 135 on this test. I didn't know what that meant. And then I looked it up. I was like, oh, that puts you in the top two percentile or whatever. And then I understood this. And during this time, they called something tracking. So after we get our civil rights, they found a way to systematically weed out the ones who they thought were smarter versus the ones who were not considered gifted because at a certain age, when we were all together, we made no distinction between the people who got free lunch or whether we all rode the bus together. And I remember I was envious of the guys who had a free lunch ticket. I asked my parents, why can't I get that? Because <laughs> I'd rather eat that than your peanut butter and jelly sandwich you fixed for me. So we're the last generation where that class stratification thing was not an issue. Some of us live in a house, some of us might have lived in apartments, but we all rode the bus together. That we were the last one. We were the beginnings of the latchkey generation, where of the, the beginnings of divorce and children starting to come home and let themselves in, and me having to watch my younger brothers to make sure they get their duties done or whatever before my father gets home. So that's what I'm saying. That, that I love the term Africology, looking at this transgenerational, how things have changed, reflecting on it, where in our history were our high points. What are some low points? What can we bring forward and reconfigure for right now? And that's why I say a good solid person to study and revisit is Martin Delaney, his life that, how does this guy become? He was accepted in the uh, Harvard Medical School, but some of the white students protested, so he got put out, even though he had helped heal people in Pittsburgh from disease, because all the other white physicians had fled in Pittsburgh. And what's interesting about Philadelphia, this region going up to New York to the Hudson Valley, this is the part of America where a lot of this speculative tradition starts. You know, when you're talking about geometry, architecture, Freemasonry, all that going from Philadelphia up to the New York region, and then how Washington, D.C. is set up. And then you got to reevaluate, well, really, who was Benjamin Banneker? So obviously, we're, rec we're creating these multidisciplinary geniuses even when, we, when many of our people were enslaved. Martin Delaney's pride, he understood, he knew which tribe or which ethnic group in Africa he was from. Was pride, and he took a lot of pride in his ethnicity. Born free. And now they recognize him recently, in the last generation, I believe, they're in 
Pittsburgh now. Another key figure you have to go back and look at, W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, in the book I have up here, Dark Water, he has a short story in there called The Comet, which is, some people just call it science fiction, but what I love about Du Bois' work, his work is still grounded in social science, and he's saying, based upon America's history, he ever thought the race problem would be solved. And he wasn't the first person to say that, but as a social scientist, because he, he's, he's still not given the credit for starting urban sociology, he gets his philosophical understanding of how to come up with a worldview studying in Germany. Because at that time, there was no nation called Germany when he was a young man. It was just a bunch of little states and duchies and dukedoms and so forth. But they put together a philosophy that was based on what they called the Volk, V-O-L-K, and hence the title of his soul, The Souls of Black Folk, in terms of in English to talk about how does this formerly enslaved population of Africans come up with a sophisticated worldview in a modern nation state that is run generation out of slavery. And so he's, he's looking at it from that perspective. And then of course, one of his opponents, Booker T. Washington, has a different philosophical perspective where it relates to training and some of the practical things that he thought African Americans needed at the time. And you have to mention Pauline Hopkins, the most popular selling author of African descent, late 19th century, early 20th century. She writes the book Of One Blood, which is kind of like the Wakanda story. A person of African descent in North America going back to Africa and discovering this civilization. And so she, this is like a pan-African science fiction novel. And that's why I always tell people, before there's Octavia Butler and all these other people, you got to look at Pauline Hopkins, what her politics were. Now, to fast forward, the conflict and confusion. Now, this is what we see as graduate students, as young scholars coming in, late 80s, early 90s. The feminist scholar Barbara Christensen wrote The Race for Theory in 1987. Because what was happening in the United States towards the end of the Cold War, a lot of European intellectuals had immigrated to America, bringing their ideas with them. And they were not a part of the freedom movement that had happened in the 60s and early 70s. And so you begin to have this fracturing in terms of knowledge influence coming into the academy at the time this term that we hear called postmodernism, post this, that, and the other. These were products of European immigrants that came here that towards the end of the Cold War was adopted in a widespread way that then come into conflict with our own understanding of our history saying uh, there, was no, there were no more grand narratives. I was like, wait a minute, you can't tell me our struggle ain't grand. I was like, now I don't know you about this little country you come from over here, but to come from where we have come from is something that will stand the test of time in terms of that narrative being told. So you can't tell me that's not a grand narrative. Um, so you see these ideas were related to Leotard, Derrida, and, uh, and others, right around the same year when Malefi comes out and is advancing Afrocentricity. And that's why I told somebody, and I said, I think I've, I might have, I probably told Malefi this and, and all this, what they did in the 90s will still be talked about 100 years from now when some of these people that are at these other schools are going to be forgotten. Because every, a lot of people in this room knows that a lot of these people that they advance here on TV, nobody talks about them outside of America, and that's just facts, as the young people say. You know, but you have to travel and put some stamps in your passport. And if you're really Afrocentric oriented, then I should see in your passport you going to South Africa, Ghana, somewhere instead of Italy and Romania and some of these other places that you like going to. Because I'm one of them people, don't say you are Afrofuturist, but then you're trying to get to break your neck to get to London this summer. Like people like me, Natasha Womack, Stacey Robinson, we've all been to Africa. Because my thing is, if you say African in front of it, I want to know how your ideas work over there in conversation with the people who live there because they'll let you know what it might look like when it's practiced here. So, Sankofa, return, engage, and bring it here. 
okay? We have this conflict in the 90s, Web 1.0, the internet gets started. I can't even imagine for what, what it's like for someone even older than me have to understand the internet and all this other stuff because in 1995, I was 31 years old and that's when graduate students started using, sending off their first emails. That's when you still had Netscape and all these other, I'm still mad at BET because I had a bunch of stuff on the email stuff they had set up that went away after a couple of years that I had saved up on there. So that's the 1.0 era email and a gentleman, I've met Mark Derry who coined the word, he'll tell you. He didn't arrive at it through no scholarship. He, he was he was just freshening up one day, getting ready for an interview when Bing, he thought of Afrofuturism and he does it in con conversation with Greg Tate. And there's a whole story about that that I hope Mark writes about it. Very ethical gentleman of European descent, but whether you're talking about older scholars that talk about Jahane Johns or the scholar who influenced Zora Neale Hurston. We have had ethical people of European descent attempt to try and describe what they were looking at. And that's why if you go on the internet, he has no issue of how I've come in and revised all of that. And I had the gall to do that because I remember a speech that it was either one, somebody from the Temple Circle gave or one of the other black study, study scholars said, that Europeans have been some of the best students of Africans in history. So I tell them, I was like, you know, that we've taught them before. Now the problem is in these days, you gotta protect your intellectual property. <laughs> you know, because that's simply the world we live in in relation to capital. Now, senior year of college, war is declared. Some of you in this room remember when Patrick Buchanan said, it is a cultural war. As critical as the kind of nation we shall be was the Cold War itself, for the war is for the soul of America. So two weeks from now will be the 30th of, uh, anniversary of the announcement of the culture war. So I don't understand academics and scholars that are out here acting like we're not in the middle of a, of a war. We had the war on drugs, and what was that, a war on who? We had the Cold War. Now, the culture war, you know who he's talking about. So all that has done is metastasize into all this alt-right stuff we see today because for a generation, once they came to the understanding that they're in a culture war, they've been institutionalizing their ideas, their money, and their systems to fight the war. And so that's why I don't waste time with people that want to come and tell me, like, oh, brother, you need to get some chakras and some other stuff. I was like, man, we're in the middle of a war. Mm -hmm. Our kids are being mentally destroyed in these schools, and you all are sitting up here happy to see a Negro get promoted on TV to something that white folks control. Like, that's a win for us. And the systems that have been set up continue. They never stopped trying to undermine, destroy, co-opt, or control what we create. That's just facts. It's been a 30-year publicly announced culture war. So my response, when I started theory building, I said, okay, that's why I said, let me see what the Temple Circle was writing about at that time. The same time Derry and these others are having these interviews up in Manhattan, uh, Dr. Keto, Dr. Asante, and others is right there in these books here. Keto's book has influenced me a lot because he talks about this African geography of reason. So if we understand what Eurocentrism really is, it's an artificially created region at the end of the Eurasian landmass that they created ideologically, and their body of reason comes from that. I have no problem with that. So for me as a person of African descent, so when I look across and see, my ancestry I identify with comes from West Africa, and so some of the ideas, and then along with what happens through the Caribbean, because you know we lost some family there, to North America. So that's my geography of reason. Because one of the things they will tell you when you're putting theory together, that's what they told us in grad school, they'll be like, well, black people, they're militant. You know, because militant is like a substrate to theory. Because we're emotional, angry, oh, you're angry. I'm like, if you look at what happened, you know, even James Baldwin, said you, you don't wake up mad every day, something is wrong with you. So, so what? So that's what I'm saying. So my geography of reason tells me 
and based upon citing their own thing, their own philosopher, John Locke in the second treatise says, anybody who enslaves you is your enemy. So that's not me being anti what? I'm citing your own people said that if you've enslaved, we, we are political enemies. So therefore, through reason, I have to come up with a philosophy to defeat you. So yeah, I don't argue with scholars when they ask, well, that replacement theory, that's right. I agree with it. We're trying to replace you. We're replacing white supremacy. That's right. <laughs> you know, so don't argue with them. They've declared the culture war. It's metastasized into what it is. So then you got to figure out how, as a person of African descent, do I fight back with my mind, my money, or whatever? And that's really what an intelligent person does. So in there, page number, because I know I got the scholars in the house watching whatever. Kendo says right here. As a futurologist, she or he can speculate, engage beyond the next century to create in sharp contrast a time map on which to trace the events of the past, create history through action in the present, and plot the path of possible future action. Now that's an African-centered version of futurity right there. And it's been there for almost 30 years. So anybody that says this is not Afrocentric, they don't read. That's why we got too many darn TED Talk people that don't want to read a book because it's got too many pages. Mm -hmm. And they got and they write blogs ad nauseum and they don't know what they're talking about. And some of them have PhDs. Mm -hmm. You know, not sociological people. There's studies that tell 95% of the people that do a PhD don't do squat two years after they're over with. So that tells you 95% of the people that are doctorate, other than their dissertation, you can't talk to them about anything. <laughs> And that's just facts. They did a study on it. You know, they said they don't write about anything five years after the dissertation. So the people sitting in this room that have been writing, those are the 5%, the people who write five years after the PhD. So they're saying the exceptional people are still writing five years after they're done. So some of these people, and that's why you got people in the classroom up there teaching and beating up on the students, and they haven't written anything worth anything since before social media and will come and tell you whether you're right or wrong and they haven't written anything in 20 years. Finally, on this, on building a theory, Anna Everett, she cites people from the temple uh, circle there. The revolution will be digitized, Afrocentricity and the digital public sphere. It's right there. Afrocentric, that's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Anna Everett, uh, still teaching out in uh, California. I think she's at Santa Cruz now. Now, these are the people as graduate students we're reading as graduate students. And so that's why, for me, uh, as an ethical person, I got to always say, these are who my teachers were. I'm influenced by who I'm building on because I'm standing on the shoulders of other people. That, um, as I had to tell some of my graduate students, I said, man, Malefi's generation, some of them were threatened with death at conferences just for putting together black caucuses just to meet with each other. People come harass them at night, knock on the door while they're in the hotel. And that's why I know uh, something was with them because I'm a former Marine. So you kind of understand my mentality of people come at me a certain way. We're trained to fight a whole classroom of people and win. <laughs> so, you know, so that's what I'm saying. These are some of the obstacles our scholars put up with just to be thought of as scholarly. And I don't have time to even talk about their work wasn't respected because it had to be on a trade press or Africa World Press. Everybody knows those black bookstores we had a generation ago. That's the only place you could get it. Mm -hmm. Now in the last 20 years, because they know it's a thing, now you can uh, get your work put into their journals as they know. Twenty fifteen. At this point, when this happens, we had a big meeting at Princeton. It was called Ferguson is the, the Future. Uh, Mike Brown, his uncle was in my class that semester he was killed and murdered. And I remember he was going through some post-traumatic stress at the time. I had students out in the streets protesting. That movement of the <laughs> Ferguson Rebellion did not turn out properly because you had too many opportunists that came in with ulterior motives to take away the narrative and the voice of the people who made the, move, the rebellion start. And that movement was started by working class and working poor young black people. 
That's who started it. And the middle class black people joined in because people that know about St. Louis, they were making money off of giving us tickets. That's how they paid for some of their bills of these area municipalities. So that shocked them when they saw professors and lawyers out there marching with the young people. And because it had, and then all these other groups with these acronyms and hashtags, I remember we saw communists, we saw this, that, and the other before black, man, by the time some of these people showed up, Black Lives Matter, the worst stuff was already over, you know? And they still don't, there are a lot of uninvestigated killings that happened during that time. And so that's why those people, I remember uh, when they came to our school, we had, I had to talk to my young people, I said, look, this is what the civil rights movement was. It was a system developed over generations to oppose a system. It starts with the Niagara Movement but comes to fruition in the 60s. It takes a system to fight a system. These people that come here don't have a system. Some of these people are just showing up to get internet followers for a brand, to sell books, to get on TV. So my job as your advisor because I don't want to get that call from your parents. Dr. Anderson, why is my son or daughter in jail? Why is so-and-so shot? So the first thing I had to tell them, I said, look, don't accept any money. And that sounded crazy to them. Now, what have we seen in the news about the people who took money? Now, their ethics and all that have been crushed now in light of everyone. Because I said, what's going to happen? The bill is going to come due, and they're going to find out who all took money during the Ferguson Rebellion. There were people that got $50,000 to get a barbershop going because they looked like they had a couple hundred people following them. You had elected officials help suppress the people's movement because it, and you can't even put it on the Republicans, the Democratic Party were afraid there was about to be an independent black movement going on. So you had some black Democrats, Democrats period, along with some unions and, and, and scholars that showed up that wanted to get their grant hustle on from other schools, you know, to study the phenomenon. I remember them. some guy had a, an Ivy League shirt standing on the fence while we out there sweating or whatever, looking at us like we are just a grant in motion, you know. So when that's, and a lot of people don't want to talk about it because they worried about becoming a trending topic on Twitter or something. I thought, I said, man, them people, who cares? So what? I said, the scholarship is going to catch up with all these people, and they're not going to be judged that well. You know? And so this is going to be an intergenerational struggle, so don't get caught up in the moment. And so we talked about some of these things at Princeton in 2015. And I remember as people were talking, I was probably the person that I, I know I didn't come across as sweet. I told the people, that look, I said, look, I don't love you. My people out here getting shot, and y'all up in here like rubbing each other on the back like it's going to be, man, we up here got all nice stuff to drink. And some of my people been in jail down there, been shot with rubber bullets. So no, I don't love y'all right now. And people was like, Ugh. but you know who was happy I said it? The young people. The young people came up afterwards and said, man, thank you for saying that. And because I also made this statement. I said, if you all had to vote on your future right now, if it's up to me, nobody over 45 should be allowed to vote because they ain't going to be alive long enough to see the results of it. That upset some people, too. And I saw this older woman, I'm going to be in the future. No, you're not. Well, you, you know, bad as your body, looking all sickly and whatever. You're not even going to be here in 30 years. I might not be here. Just let the young, because when you just got the young people vote, they vote for stuff different than somebody who's scared of losing a job or having white folks mad at them. The 35 and under crowd, they're fearless. They have nothing to lose. You know, people that got something to lose should not be allowed to vote on people's future. That's my opinion. If you got something to lose, you do not need to vote. You can give some advice. We need the advice. But you're voting from a position of fear. And I want people that vote who are voting from a position of courage and victory, not people um, who are afraid of losing something. And so all of this came out at the Ferguson is the Future and that was my little small contribution, which is probably why I have not been invited back to that place. <laughs> but hey, you know, my money has not suffered. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm gonna still get my my beans and whatever when I get what I like to eat. So, and we just got it. We're at that point where now where uh, people of us that got to start doing some truth speaking 
Yeah. Now, and telling the truth because a lot of people are, are, are not doing that. Oh, let me get to this next slide here. Here we go. Now, here's a breakdown of what I call where we are now at this moment. To have Afrocentricity and Afrofuturism, how they work together, got to have Afrocentricity present, dealing with agency, location. Because some people going to the future are acting out of dislocation. You know, we got different words for people that are dislocated from their identity. I don't need to go into it. This African-centered geography of reason, because once you operate from that, then you understand the politics. Why? I have, man, I ain't lying. I tell you what, if people didn't know where Ukraine was, they know where it is now. Now, in European historiography, y'all know in class, we don't even study the Eastern Europeans. They're not considered European because they're Slavic people because they have the Cyrillic alphabet. Mm -hmm. What we think of as Europe is Western Europe, mm -hmm. the Catholics, the Protestants, not the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And that's just facts. But now we done learned more about that region since February. We probably know more about it than the state that we're next to where you live. Y'all probably know more about it than West Virginia mm -hmm. because of the geopolitics involved. The so I just say the location of African people in time and space with agency. It currently operates as the high culture of the African diaspora and African practitioners. And I don't run away from saying, oh, why you say high culture? I'm like, look, anytime you got a group of bright people that's doing science, art, you know, that's called high culture. No, I'm not doing what the trap music people are doing. Okay? And that's why I, and we demonstrated that when we did the Carnegie Hall Festival for two months this year. If you look at it, we had it all over New York City, 80 different locations. Nobody got shot, stabbed, beat up, robbed, disrespected, or nothing because, you know, people will put more value in some nonsense that make news than a lot of African people coming together, sitting together, dignified, appreci appreciating art, culture, and science, and philosophy. So that's why I told the New York Times, the paper of record for liberals, mm -hmm. I said, no, this is the high culture of the African diaspora right now, and I stand on that, and I got no pushback from their editorial people. Um, it's characterized by five dimensions, metaphysics, aesthetics, theoretical and applied science, social sciences, and programmatics. And this is one of the arguments during the height of the pandemic, where some people were mad at me because I was advocating taking the, the Moderna shot. I said, African people believe in science? Y'all out here, I was like, you know, what, there were scientists in Africa. We invented mathematics and architecture and all this. That you have to have science to do that. Why are you anti-science, <laughs> you know? So these are discussions on a basic level people have been having. The first one, metaphysics, what is that? That's an ontology or a meaning of existence. Epistemolic, truth functional aspects of knowledge, cosmogony or origin of the universe. Cosmology, the structure of the universe. And so that's where I look at the African traditional religion, you know? Other ethnic groups, they, whether you're going into uh, Islam or whatever, they have their cosmology, cosmogony is all situated a certain way to reinforce their metaphysics. And they bring that metaphysics with them into their art, how they produce art, and all of their other um, uh, 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 qualities that they consider what it means to be them as a, representing them as a human being. Here's aesthetics art, literature, and performance produced by African people. That's why, for my brothers and sisters that don't even like reading, I just say, okay, Black Panther. All right, oh, I got it. All right, because I know they're not going to read nothing. You know, or, you know, just, I mean, you know, it's just facts. They're not going to read the book I tell them to read. I say, okay, they, because in Black Panther, they're bringing together an African worldview in terms of the, the ancestral plane. They're bringing together African clothes, languages, and so forth. Now, the part that didn't go by, I was like, no, and no African stuff that I've heard is the CIA man, the hero. Now, that was the major flaw I had with it. And I had problems with him going to Geneva saying, we're going to help whatever, when he should have been going to the African over in Addis Ababa. But I mean, that, I mean, but like I tell people, and I wrote about it, we can't expect um, Ryan Coogler who had to deal with Hollywood, they just wanted to make some money, and they now are awakened to the fact that, oh, there's a lot of money in this. But the thing is, as scholars, I got to give people a framework to understand what's being produced. 
So you can understand why people like it, dislike it, or what, what's making it. Because, and it works right now because there's a major black consciousness movement in the world right now. You got a new a black woman vice president in Colombia. They're even recognizing the indigenous people in India as a black president. She, they, and that was the first time I've heard, and we understood as scholars what India was about, but this is the first time I've heard them say it. The indigenous people versus the Aryan uh, speaking Indian people. The, the indigenous people are dark black people. Yes. And that's why I say, so you, that tells you who were the original Indians. That's why, but they called them the indigenous people. So that tells you that them people that's doing that Hindu nationalism are the invaders right. that came down in there. The Aryans, and that's why their stuff, Hitler and all of them would borrow some of their symbols. And that's why some of the alt right now, they're talking about uh, Kali or Shiva now saying a cycle of destruction is going. They're tapping into in Hindu metaphysics mm -hmm. because before the Aryan peoples crossed the Caucasus and all that, they're going into all this metaphysical mm -hmm. stuff that goes back to Hindu metaphysics. Mm -hmm. that, and they're saying that. So they're prepared to do all this stuff that's tied to January 6th, and, they, and they, uh, they combine it with technology and accelerationism and say, oh, yes, we're going to have destruction first. So that's, they're letting you know before we will accept black and brown people or Jewish people or whatever as human beings, we will destroy this thing rather than engage their humanity and have a real democracy. Now, they've told you that. Now, when somebody tells, now didn't Maya Angelou say when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. So that's not me saying I'm anti them. That means, oh, he told me he's my enemy, so I'm going to prepare. So, yeah, my wife will tell you during the pandemic. So while other people was out here praying, Dr. Anderson went and got some ammunition <laughs> and my Cobra pump, and I was prepared to do what's ever necessary to deal with those type of people in self-defense. Because they've told me who they're coming for. Right. So why we act like they're not trying to come for us? Um, there, a quote on the site on there when they said, well, what about this black speculative? In the, look at the citation closely. It says, Pfeiffer, 1975, Black American Speculative Literature, a checklist. In there, he's providing, and I'll even tell people, he's a white man, too. He'll tell you. Black, what? Black speculative literature emerges roughly the same time European science fiction does. Mm -hmm. European science fiction emerges out of a totally different set of circumstances mm -hmm. where black speculative lit and experience emerges as an opposition to scientific racism, mm -hmm. the enslavement of Africans. So it had a different set of mm -hmm. circumstances that influences its creation. Mm -hmm. So when I hear people of African descent say, oh, yeah, this is a African, this is, and it's a subset or a subgenre of sci-fi. So why are you recolonizing yourself under Europeans again when the scholarship is right there that's saying we've set up our own thing? But see, that's why you're going to see people that, because they want to get the Booker Award, the Pulitzer, or whatever. Yes, I do this, and I'm a And those of us who want to write for freedom and having our own thing, our own fine and fig tree, as they say in another religion, they're going to go that way. So the scholarship there, they, so that's what, 50 years ago it was identified. So that's why I debate people when they say, well, I do black science fiction. And then I, and, but they don't even know, see, there are people out here saying stuff, and they don't even know where this terminology comes from. One of the biggest science fiction writers in the world, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, early late 19th century, early 20th century, who was also a, a, a peer of Du Bois, said, feminism is for white women. It is for white women to assess white men in the governance of the world. Feminism. That's how she defines it. Charlotte Perkins Gilman or Gilman Perkins, one of them hyphenated names like that, Inc. from England. She writes about that, but she's also, she's running around, she's a peer of H.G. Wells. So the people who start this speculative literary movement, I've said H.G. Wells, Martin Delaney, all these, these people were also sophisticated political people that created what we now call science fiction and speculative thought. They weren't just some people, you know, out here uh, chewing bubble gum and whatever. They, it was connected to their politics, and it was informed by a certain metaphysics, and that's why they wrote it the way they wrote it. They're dealing with physics now and culture. This came out in the last decade linking adinkras to theoretical physics. 
So when people like Malcolm X said, oh, I ain't leave nothing in Africa, look what you left in Africa. They are now understanding that Africans were dealing with high levels of physics and theoretical science at that time. And that's why the gentleman who's dealing with that was a part of the Obama White House. The gen I can't think of his name right now. It was at the University of Maryland dealing with theoretical, drawing these connections between African uh, science and theoretical physics. Uh, social science. Let me get on through here, um, so it's an application. And then programmatics. So what kind of programming are you putting as a reflection of the philosophy? Unveiling Visions was the very first Afrofuturist exhibition in this country that included a large group of artists. We had over 80 of them. We supported it with scholarship. We put out two books, Afrofuturism 2.0 and then the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Because one of the things we insisted upon, we're not gonna be out there just making up stuff from like at the back of a Cracker Jack box. We're gonna make sure that everything we talk about and put in the community is based upon scholarship. BSAM is one of those movements, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, so we put our theory into practice. Another one I like is uh, one of our students, Michelle Taylor, has put together the Sankofa Summer School, which is a virtual school to deal with education issues. And here we are in South Africa, in Johannesburg, two, four years ago, talking with people on the continent, organizing around these concepts. We had a whole classroom full of young people there that were excited. We gave away books and materials that they can go with. And now if you talk about Afrofuturism, South Africa is probably one of the, in the top five dealing with the topic. And it's one, really one of the top ones on the African continent really getting in front of this. Four pillars for a vision of Africological leadership, transgeneration, transgenerational African leadership and Afrofuturism. Got to understand what is Moore's law, or some people say Moore law, Moore's law plus an AI. Since 2018, where you see the introduction of AI and bots, and then COVID, where a lot of production and a lot of other creativity moved onto social platforms, we have this sense of time speeding up because we don't control our space and time. Malefi wrote in the book on Malcolm X's essays, he or she that controls time and space controls your destiny. So this is about time and space. Foresight, look and see where things are going. Insight, understanding why they're happening. And then oversight, like GPS connecting all the dots. Why is what happening on the Eurasian land continent with the Ukraine war important? How does it impact us? That's having a GPS kind of mentality. See, how does, why is the war in Ukraine have some of our people starving in Africa? In a multipolar world, what does this look like? They talk about the metaverse, which is basically, you know, that's really, you're going to voluntarily put yourself into the matrix. You're going to get, you're going to let the, the metaverse babysit your kid because you don't want to spend a few dollars for an after school activity and then wonder why they turn out in these streets all acting all foolish. Keto in his book talks about a pluriverse, where there's a multiple ways of looking at the world and the universe. We're in an area of deglobalization now. The supply chains, because I remember I noticed it at the dollar store now, all the prices started going up where we got stuff because the stuff from China wasn't getting here on time. So now they're saying deglobalization, we got to move manufacturing back to the home country. And now they love African Union now. Will the AU get a seat at the table? February, they need a Security Council seat. And then economic, they, we need to make them a part of the G20. Why? A hundred years ago, European thinkers said, we will not continue to dominate the world unless we continue to control Africa and Latin America. They said that a hundred years ago. <laughs> so them uh, Africans might are going to be like, hey, we give them a seat because guess what? If we give them these seats, that means they're going to be our allies against the new world order of China and the junior partner Russia on the Eurasian landmass. Because in their philosophy, they call Eurasia the world island, mm -hmm. and whoever controls the world island controls the world. So if you look at Europe and then you throw in Russia, China, and India, don't care. We just want our gas. That's a majority of the world is not supporting Europe right now. Mm -hmm. So what Malcolm X said, you got how many African seats in the UN get vote? So to me, I was so proud of the Africans saying, no, we ain't taking a side. So what has happened is that Biden, all, they came up, well, we gonna give Africa $600 billion for development. And the Africans said, all right, what you got? 
the, all of a sudden they getting grain shipments coming in. The Russians are letting grain shipments come in. Because I look at it simply without reading the book. If I know I got two bullies in the neighborhood stronger than me and they fighting each other, I want them to keep fighting each other. Because that means they are too weak to come beat up on me and I can keep doing push-ups. Yeah, y'all keep fighting. I'm going to keep, mm-hmm. I want y'all to fight about 10 years while I build these muscles up and get strong enough to say no on my own. So to me, and people, when I mean, some of the left is, well, what do you stand? I said, look, I don't have a dog in that fight. That's a European land war. I think Russia is wrong, but NATO is not right. Because NATO invaded Africa. Africans know NATO's been used to kill so many Africans. And so I'm supposed, and they're using black people on MSNBC telling these little pity party stories. And you got thousands of people dying in the Congo and Ethiopia, and they had nothing to say. And that's why history is not going to view the black members of CNN and MSNBC that intelligently. All of them, I don't care, Joy Reid, all of them are going to look at it. They were limited. Or them not knowing depending on their salary. So they couldn't say what they wanted to say. As I said, referencing Upton Sinclair, sometimes your salary dictates what you're allowed to say. Uh, so challenges, digitization, miniaturization, quantum computing, biotech, climate change, neo-fascism. So what can people do? We got to connect climate crisis to colonialism, reparations, all this stuff has to come together if people are serious about it. So, but you got to understand where your agency and, or, and, and geography of reason comes from because I'm not going to support other people's stuff. So that means the first thing I'm about, where are you on reparations? Because I know whatever, you all are going to decide what you need to do to save yourself. My folk need resources so they can survive too. And I'm not going to get behind you unless you, we have some reparations as part of this deal. Period. And that's a non-negotiable thing, you know, so, you know, non-negotiable. And thank you. These are a couple of references I'll leave at the end. And I'll take some questions. All right. All right, all right. We have time for about two questions. If you could just raise your hand, I'll come over to you with the mic. Let's see if I make that. Any questions? All right. Yes, um, yes, hello. Um, hello. Okay, yes, yes, I got here, you know, near the tail end, but, um, but based just on what I heard you say, you know, yes, you, you made me think about something when you mentioned about um, the blacks that are on MSNBC and CNN. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd like to ask, like, you know, you know, with everything that you was mentioning in this presentation, mm -hmm. And yeah, and I thought about a current situ about a situation that's currently going on on my job. Um, and it's a lot of black people that, that that I work with. And I remember I asked myself, and I actually asked my mom over the weekend. You know, why is it when our people get into these get into positions of authority? That the workplace seems to turn upside down. <laughs> that's your question? Yes. That's what they were hired to do. Because uh, I'm going to tell you, this is why, let me try and say this in a way so they don't call my job. Uh. Um, <laughs> I just remember in the 80s when I'm coming out of high school, going to college, they had a thing, they called it multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. Then by the 90s, it was called diversity. And now it's called something else. Now, I'm at the point now I understand my grandfather a lot better, and he only had a fifth grade education. And he said, uh, if the money don't add up, it don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And some people are hired to be gatekeepers mm -hmm. so white people can ex uh, escape being called racist. And that's, and that's why I'm like, that's why one of the things, because I've gotten kind of cynical now, I'm like, okay, who's the human resource person? And if something happens, that's their job to come out and put a nice look on it. Or 
uh, some people get a job to come in there and destroy and destroy your agency. If they've developed, the, I'll give you an example, a practical example. I came from a historically black college before I came to Temple, and I betrayed my class status because I helped the faculty organize a union. Because I understand, based upon our history, at a lot of our black institutions, at the state HBCUs, a lot of them people are closet Republicans. Mm -hmm. Because it's a Republican-dominated South legislature, right. so they want a certain type of black person, man or woman, to run the place. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, the institution was set up to be like, mm -hmm. because we don't want your kids. But now you have to look at those institutions the way you would a mid-cap level organization that generates multiple millions of dollars a year. And so some people are put there to make sure something doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. wow. So me being a strategist, I said, well, what's the thing where, and this is where I was bold with my stuff. I remember the vice president of communications at the time, they were mad at me. You know, I'm supposed to be a little bougie, light-skinned black PhD married to the beautiful medical doctor, whatever. I'm supposed to be hanging with them. And I said, no, I'm going to be with the people on this one. And I remember there was a, I had a white colleague that came to me who he saw how bad it was, but he came to me and said, Ronaldo, I can't make this work without you. And I knew what he meant because he knew that a lot of the black faculty, if I wasn't behind it, they weren't going to roll with him. Mm -hmm. So they never thought the black and white faculty would come together and go against the black bourgeoisie mm -hmm. who ran the institution. Mm -hmm. And then I told the vice president, I said, you know why we're going to win? Because the union dollars and money behind us is more than what you all have. Because when you go to war, the first thing you size up, where the money, the guns, the food, and the butter coming from. And once I sized that up, I knew we were going to win. So, and that's what I told her in her office, that we're going to win. But see, a lot of times, the younger people now, people over the age of 40 act like they don't know nothing. And it's all about, uh, I got to get mine. And they don't know how to put together the collective organization to go and get more power. And one of the mistakes, one of my people that mentored me, I remember a, name, a lady named Hattie Weaver, she said, you know, one of the biggest mistakes we made going into the 70s, we stopped having our own like black labor organizations. Because what, and by the time the 70s rolled around, they incorporated them, they joined the AFL-CIO, all these people in the names of multiculturalism. But I don't even care, but I look at money, guns, land, mm -hmm. that tells you who's in charge. I don't care about all the other superfluous stuff, what you say. What happened to think, dang what you say, I just watch what you do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Obama had a nice message coming in and he's the first president to get away with bombing Africa. Because if he'd have been white, we'd have been out there, we'd have overrun the White House. You got that right. I remember sitting in a Sunday school when they used Michelle Obama to come out and cry for the little girls that Boko Haram had dealt with. And I saw supposedly black Christians, they were ready to go send the US Marines to go kill Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And that was the, and I remember one of the scholar, black scholars said in the 90s, the day would come where you'll see black folk killing other black folk mm -hmm. in Africa. So this administration, that, that's why I say Obama, I'm like, I only voted for him because he was black, not because he was good. <laughs> and this is why, right. and I tell people, because a lot of our people understand or operate at a level where if they don't see a black person win and they don't know how to level up. So to me, he served his purpose, changing our mindset so we have higher expectations and policies. Other than that, he is of no more use. Mm -hmm. He's like, in the relation to capitalism, he's like a used car salesman. He was to sell us a product, but he don't own the car lot. Right. <laughs> That's all he was. The used car salesman getting us to get a product to buy an Americana for another generation. That's all he was. And if you said that, Maxine Waters said it. We would tell him something, but y'all love him too much. And, Ma and that's why Maxine Waters and stuff was like the gold standard of her. Some of us are old enough to remember when she had to make, she bought the CIA to S South Central when they found out they were behind the crack cocaine thing in the 80s. So uh, Maxine Waters, I'm like, Maxine Waters, that's like the gold standard of wow. critiquing. A gun. And she told you, if you go put up, she said, we would do some stuff, but y'all love him too much. So, and that's just the facts. And so that's what I'm saying. Now, if you all are oppressed, 
they hired a few people for you all to, you know, have a lot of confusion and watch you all. That's what's happening in Detroit now. For the first time since 1954, Detroit will not have a black congressman. They're going to be represented by Middle Eastern or somebody from India, a millionaire, because the black folks ain't organized. And so you get what you get when you don't do what you're supposed to do. You know, that's just it now. The gentrification is real. They're already figuring out how to use the latest census data on everybody. They're saying, based upon the data, the black suburbanites, based upon the interviews, supposed to have different values than the people that live in the city. So that's why if something happens to me at my new house, I'm going to get on Malefi and say, I tried to hang with you all in the city, Malefi, and look what happened. <laughs> we have another question, Dr. Yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Dr. Anderson, wow. A great presentation, just mind blowing. No, very, you. very, very, very well done. Um, my question, going back to the Afrofuturism. Now mm -hmm. we know that the roots of anything is very, very important. Mm -hmm. The roots don't change. Right. We may branch out, mm -hmm. go in different directions. All of mm -hmm. that is good because mm -hmm. that's growth as long as we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. So with Afrofuturism, can you share with us the foundation of that and how Afrocentricity with this agency and location, how that plays a part in that. Okay, let me try and give it. I, I laid out its dimensions and stuff. Okay, what does it look like? I would say what it is, it's a, I call it a worldview that equips us for survival. Um, SNCC, the, the, you know, SNCC, NAACP, that's not preparing us for the future. We're the first group of human beings in history now that are gonna have to deal with five vectors of change and one of them by itself has made civilizations collapse. That's why I recommend reading Joseph Tainter's book, The Collapse of Complex Societies. If you go back and study the plague, the plague weakened Rome. If you go uh, uh, study what happens to other societies when one makes a technological leap, and then what, now we're facing plagues, technological leaps, climate change, we're facing, and any one of them by itself is enough to make a society collapse. So I'm one of them people, because I believe in what people say, I'm one of people, it's about to be dog eat dog, um, survival of the fittest type of, of mentality which is in opposition to Afrocentricity. That's my child, I said, that's why at the end I said, Afrofuturism and Afro are gonna have to operate in a multipolar world of competing interest, and it's gonna be unstable for a while. What happened in Sri Lanka was the beginning of a set of dominoes that's supposed to end in Africa. Now, uh, Tabo and Becky in South Africa said South Africa is ready to have an African spring now because the, the poverty gap is so wide there and unemployment and that goes back to where you got to critique what Nelson Mandela was about. Nelson Mandela is not beloved by the younger people mm -hmm. because he gave up too much to get too little. Yep. You know, and that's just facts. But what, exactly. what, but they, the Western media will overwhelm us with Nelson Mandela's, mm -hmm. but you don't hear about Kwame Nkrumah, right. who even the Africans said was their greatest intellectual prophet of the 20th century. Right. And then if you're talking about a scholarship, I didn't have time to talk about Sheikh Anta Diop. They would just say, look at the science and the politics and they'll tell you what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. so, I have to, so I don't say everything because you know, uninformed people get mad at the messenger. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they'll be like, oh, he said this. I said, you know what? I'm gonna just tell the people I love in private, look, you need to do this, this, and this. And guess what? When it gets bad enough, they are gonna call you because they know who's gonna tell them the truth. And I sold this to, uh, an example of where that looks like in terms of thinking about the future uh, in relation to community. And I'll tell you, I said this at Wash U University two weeks ago, uh, based upon a film that I was part of, they talk about that dealt with the aftermath of Ferguson and the young people getting killed on the street. And I told a 90% uh, European American audience, I said, look, you all don't wanna hear from people like me Y'all want a black scholar who get on TV and make you feel good and talk about brother and my brother this and my sister that or talk about or something, something, something remixed with some quote from James Baldwin 
and they like that. And I told her, I said, look, I don't have to be here. My wife and I together make more butter and live better than most white people do. So I don't even measure myself against white people. You know, most white people's lives are crappy compared to mine. I don't have to be bothered with y'all. But part of where that transgenerational part comes in, I was living out a promise of a brother that was in the black revolution in the 60s that helped me get through grad school. And he told me before I left grad school, he said, Ronaldo, you're married to a physician. You're going to be an outstanding scholar. But I want you to keep me one promise. I said, what's up, man? He said, look, you help those people because he helped me. It's, it's not complicated. You got to pay it back, as the people say. And there are people out here with gifts that could do that. But, but then if you see somebody like a Malafia then pay it back, you got to protect them. See, that's one of the things I told after Lee. The, the young people always told me, Dr. Anderson, you go out. I said, no, I'm not. I said, Jesus has come already because I know how my people are. I'll get out front, pow, something happened, and they'll be at lunch two days later. Man, that's messed up how they did Dr. A. So, no, I don't love y'all that much. I said, you, I said, I have a wife and the children. I'm going to write about stuff. I'll convene meetings. I'll say this. And if you read, you'll know what to do. You don't have to wait on people like me or Malefi or Nada to get out here and get hit over the head because I can't do any more kickoff returns and punt returns with y'all. So I'm just saying it's all there in writing. But I'm, as a student, it's not my job to unzip your head and pour it in there. You got to do some of the work yourself. And that's why in our movement, your education don't determine leadership. We got people there with no college degrees that's rocking this stuff who everyone listens to. So we said, no, your work and what you create determines who gets heard, not what kind of doctorate you have. Because so, you know, so that's what I'm saying. So some of that stuff is like the old fashioned stuff that used to be done. We're revisiting a lot of these things and we're going back, restudying who was Hoyt Fuller, who was Elaine Locke. What were these people doing so we can make some new mistakes instead of old mistakes? And that's what happened to Ferguson. They, made, they didn't even go back and study what had been done before them. And that's what I'm saying. You study the past, and in the quote it says, do something for right now and prepare for the future. That's all Afrofuture really is. You study, you get the best of the past, plan right now to direct yourself toward the future. Thank, Thank you. All right. I want to thank all of you who attended in person, who are out here. I want to thank Dr. Anderson, of course, for all the wisdom that you've taught us today. And I also want to shout out everyone on YouTube um, from so many different countries. It just means so much to all of us here at the Institute that you've joined us. Um, I do want to mention that we do now have Cash App for donations. Our sign is the dollar sign MKA Institute dollar sign MKA Institute if you are interested in donating and thank you so much for all those who have donated already I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Sante to close us and then we are done thank you very much we were very very delighted very happy and it was a, was a great program and thank you so much Dr. Anderson and uh, Toyosi uh, Abadarin uh, who is our uh, technical uh, person. We want to thank her. And we want to thank uh, several of our board members who are here. Um, uh, Carlton, uh, Sudan, uh, Kareem Board, uh, Dr. Jabali uh, Ade, Dr. Nadav. Uh, there may be others who are here. We, we're very, very thankful, very, very proud of all the people who make this possible. And certainly want to thank also uh, Anna Yaninga, uh, who is uh, always here and who got here very early this morning in our physical building to clean the building and to make certain that everything was in order for the speaker and also for uh, the technicians. Um, one announcement, and that is on August the 21st, we will have the lecture Dr. Nadav will be talking on the Afrocentric school. And maybe I should just mention to you uh, what else is happening because we're going to have um, uh, after that on September the 4th, you can put this on your calendar. And those of you who are listening uh, globally, please put this on your calendar. Uh, August the 21st, after that, September the 4th, 
Yasinia Escobar uh, from Colombia. We'll be talking about um, the election of Francia Elena Marquez and the condition of African people in Colombia. That's going to be September the 4th. On September the 11th, Arabization and Europeanization in Africa, Solidarity with Sudan, uh, Tugu Sanusi uh, is going to be here, and I'm going to enjoy having a conversation with him about that process. Uh, September the 25th, well, actually, on September the 24th, there will be a poss I think it's September the 24th, which is not on our uh, MKA uh, Institute lecture calendar, but will probably be um, inserted in the calendar. September the 24th is a Saturday. And on that particular Saturday, I think there will be a, uh, a, a conference, a YouTube conference, that is being called by uh, Professor Maulana Karenga and myself uh, on Pan-Africanism, Afrocentricity, and Kawaida, crafting an African agenda uh, for the future. So that would be on September the 25th. It is being planned right now. So uh, it, uh, I will let you know uh, on August the 21st uh, what the exact dates are for that particular uh, conference. Then on um, September the 25th, uh, Attorney Michael Cord uh, will be talking about uh, participating in the uh, political process. October the 9th, uh, Contemporary Issues in Africa, in Nigeria, Sudan, South Africa. Uh, and uh, then October the 23rd, the United States of Africa, Dr. Zizwe Po, and then where do we go from here uh, on November the 13th with Dr. Jabali Ade and Dr. Malefi Asante, we're gonna be coordinating that. So that's basically uh, where we are so far. Uh, there will be other things added. We will also announce when we will set up our um, uh, site uh, for our trip to Kemet which will be next year in 2023. So we really look forward to many things. And I just want to, again, thank you for coming. And we say we call upon our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to render mercy, to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people forever. It is done. Thank you very much. Thank you.